I had the privilege of uh, working in this industry very early in life. I've been working in this industry for over 50 years. Who is that little girl? Who's that Troy? And hey Troy, I know somebody who is an expert on these things. Um, Oscar. Oscar, right. You can cut it, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Such a privilege growing up on that show. I was on the show, I began season one and I stayed on the show for six wonderful years. Unfortunately, those six years were also some of the most challenging six years of my life. While I was playing on the show on Sesame Street during the daytime at home, my life was riddled with physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. As a result of the abuse that I endured, I was emotionally unstable, and by the age of nine, I attempted suicide for the first time. Fortunately, I failed. Unfortunately, there are far too many kids under the age of 12 who are successfully taking their lives. And I wasn't sure if it was ever going to come to an end. I had no idea how to regulate those unwanted emotions. By the age of 12, I had been hospitalized as a result of physical abuse from my out of control and angry mother. I will never forget the day that my father gave me what he believed to be solid career advice. I was 13 years old and he said, Troy, unfortunately, sweetheart, you are half black and you're a female. Black females just don't make it in America. So I suggest you pay close attention and typing and shorthand and you become an excellent typist so that one day you can have a job working for a very rich white man in the state capital, which was Boise, Idaho at the time. Today, I stand here certain that what happened to me happened for me. I was determined to return to show business I was determined to become a big star and I was determined to make my father very, very wrong. That road to stardom was, was paved with even more pain. I lived in a homeless shelter for a few years that was run by the Salvation Army. I liked it there, it was safe, I got three meals a day. And I continued to audition while I was living in the homeless shelter. But today, I stand here and I say what happened to me happened for me. I also found myself in one abusive relationship after the other. But here's the irony. At the age of 24, the next slide for me, please. I'm having some challenges. Okay. Well, I'm really good with challenges, so let's keep rolling. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> So here's the irony. I'm living in a Salvation, uh, Salvation Army sponsored homeless shelter and I'm auditioning and at the age of 24, I get really, really lucky and I book a leading role on a TV show called Dynasty. Now, you know, God has a great sense of humor, right? I'm living in this homeless shelter, I'm penniless, and I book a job, and the character that I portray is Jackie Devereaux, a very wealthy child who goes to boarding school in Switzerland. <laughs> she competes, you know, in, in all these fancy sports, and she has two parents that absolutely worship the ground she walks on. I had so much fun on that show, and being on that show was the beginning of a new life for me. It was a game changer. My life soon resembled that of the a modern day Cinderella story. And not only did I kiss my prince, I began dating the artist known as Prince, and we were together for seven beautiful years. I miss him. <laughs> I dated the artist known as Prince for several years, and after my career as a starlet in Hollywood grew brighter and brighter, the opportunities for fame and fortune grew bigger and bigger. I felt like I had finally arrived, but unfortunately, I did not 
get an opportunity to stay. Today, I stand here certain that what happened to me all happened for me. Not only was I fired from Dynasty, Prince publicly dumped me. I married and divorced another man who is the father of my child. And although I was at the time a very wealthy young lady, I was alone and I soon realized that I had a big problem. I finally had to admit that people didn't want to stay around me because I was an angry human being filled with uncontrollable rage. By the age of 42, my anger and rage was so out of control, I was arrested for domestic violence. The judge sentenced me to 52 weeks of rage and anger management classes. Today, I stand here certain that what happened to me happened for me. My being arrested was the absolute best thing that could have ever happened to me because the road I was heading on was not going to be the road that I wanted to be on. The woman said to me, you're right in time because the VIP jail cell is available. Paris Hilton just checked out. <laughs> I was like, okay, well that night as I placed my head on the pillow, presumably used by Paris Hilton, I had to finally tell myself the truth. I had to admit that I was an angry, out of control, rageful person. I was just like my angry mother and I was just like my rage-possessed father. I think you guys are gonna see all the slides right now. <laughs> and so a week after my arrest, I stood before the expressionless, ju expressionless judge and he sentenced me to a 52-week anger management program. My first inclination was to argue with him. I wanted him to know that I did not have an anger issue. And as I started to argue with him, I remembered the breakthrough I'd had the night before. And I realized that it was time for me to start not only telling myself the truth, the truth, but living that truth, like I have a problem. Keeping it real, I have to say, admitting that we have a problem is just the first step. It in no way cured me of my problem. During the first week of the anger management program, I was miserable. I was still angry that I got arrested, and I was even angrier that I had to attend those meetings. Every week, I would walk through the door, and I would take my angry body and plop it on the couch, and I would have my eyes glued to the clock, counting the seconds that I could get out of there. I didn't want anything to do with anyone in that room. I felt there were... I'm sorry, you guys. Oh, there we go. There's a fired one. <laughs> okay, we're not going to do that. I felt as though I was with people that I didn't want to be with. I didn't want to have anything to do with any of those women in the room. These are some of the pictures that I wanted to share with you during my starlit time um, in Hollywood. And let's see, there's me with Prince. It's fun. Ah, oh, my perfect parents. Not at all. Okay, so I'm going to, can we turn off the slides? I'm, I'm too challenged by it right now. Thank you. So as I'm sitting there, I'm looking at these women. I feel like I'm really not supposed to be there. I don't want to be there. I want out. I'm angry. I'm upset about it. Halfway through the program, I had what Carl Jung refers to as the dark night of the soul. On that night, I let it all out. I threw myself on the ground and I cried and I cried and I cried. I felt deep sadness for all those things that I really just thought I was angry about. From the abuse I suffered at the hands of my mother, to the disappointment I experienced when I finally met my father, to Prince dumping me publicly, to my divorce, and so on. The sadness was so unbearably heavy, but I needed to cry in solitude from my soul for my soul, to my soul. It was a cry I had never experienced before, and as much as it hurt, it felt so good to just let it all out. That night, something 
amazing was being born. Several hours later, after I finished crying for myself and all the things I thought I was angry about, I was surprised to find myself crying for the women in my court-mandated anger management program. I was crying because I finally realized that regardless of their backgrounds, they were all simply normal people like me, normal people with abnormally painful childhoods and past painful experiences that have all been left unresolved. Experiences that still hurt and were in desperate need of being unconcealed, revealed, and healed. As I continued to cry for these women that I now recognized as me, I felt the sadness their anger was masking. I felt the shame and embarrassment their anger had caused them. I felt their hopelessness, and then once again, I felt my own hopelessness. And I sobbed out loud, I wish I could help them. And then I heard this voice say, Troy, get up. I looked around and I heard it again. It said, Troy, get up right now or you better plan on forever staying down. I paused, I looked around, and I heard the voice say again, right here, right now, you decide at this moment who you're going to be in your life and what you're going to do in your life. You either get up right now or you just stay down forever. I got up. And that night, I believe I gave birth to a purpose that still takes my breath away. That night, I decided that I was going to dedicate my life to discovering new and innovative ways to help people heal their emotional pain. The next day I registered for college and I declared that I was going to learn everything I could about human psychology and spirituality. And it was then that I first began to realize that those experiences that were challenging, those weren't stumbling stones after all, they were stepping stones. And it was then that I realized that everything that had happened to me was really, truly happening for me. I needed to experience various forms of abuse, anger, humiliation, abandonment, and profound sadness. Because today, my greatest strength as a teacher does not come from the years of intense academic training that has led to a doctorate in clinical psychology. My greatest strength and power as a teacher comes from my on-the-court life experiences and the level of unwavering and unshakable empathy that I get to bring to my interactions with the thousands of people that I am now blessed to work with. And to this day, I now know that my parents are the greatest teachers I have ever had, and I thank them for giving me a front row view of a life that I never wanted to create for myself. I even became grateful for my father's career advice, and I am happy that I took his advice. And remember that anger management program I told you about that the judge sentenced me to? I went back to that program, and I taught that very same program for a few years. I can't tell you how amazing it was to be able to sit in the chair and watch as those court mandated women would walk in to the room, they would flop their angry bodies on the couch and they would fix their gazes on the clock. And the first thing I would say to them is, hey, I am you. And they would be like, what? And I'd explain my story to them and instantly you could see the shift in their demeanor because they knew that I was there for them, that I believed in them and I wanted them to win. And sometimes that's all it takes to help a person lean courageously into whatever that dark night of their soul is, 
whatever that experience, that breakdown is that's gonna produce the breakthrough so that they can be born into their purpose. And that's who I got to be for those women. Yes, everything that happened to me happened for me. I gave birth to my purpose 12 years ago. I have been fulfilling that purpose over the last 12 years by mastering my understanding of what it is to be a human being. I then got present to how we humans from childhood are taught to suppress our emotions. We are told to ignore our negative thoughts, which makes no sense because what we resist will persist. It's physics. So I begin instructing myself and my clients how to welcome all thoughts without judgment. I learned how to meditate and now I set time aside every day to allow my thoughts to freely flow. After 11 years of academic study, therapy, self-reflection and countless plant ceremonies in South America, I was finally able to uniquely fulfill on my purpose and I did so by designing a science-based program that I called Mindology Fitness. It's a gym for the mind. It's a mental health program that is effective, fun, and affordable for everyone, everywhere. Without a doubt, the inspiration for Mindology Fitness, Fitness adults came from those beautiful women that I fell in love with during my anger management class sentence. I am so certain that what happened to me happened for me. 10 months ago, I created Mindology Fitness Kids. Without a doubt, the inspiration for Mindology Fitness Kids was a little girl named Troy who played on Sesame Street during the day while contemplating ways to die at night. As I sat down to design the kids program, I forced myself to reconnect with the pain that I experienced as a child. And once I was present to that old pain, I remember asking myself, what is missing? The presence of which would make a difference. And I finally got it. When it comes to mental health, the children are no different than the adults. We all want the same things. We want the tools to ensure that our peace of mind is in our hands at all times. And that's what Mindology Kids provides for our children. Mindology Fitness Kids teaches our children how to self-regulate their emotions. And they love it. They love knowing how to organically be in control of their mind, how to organically be in control of their hearts. I am crystal clear everything that happened to me happened for me so that I could have the insight, the desire, and the drive to design Mindology Fitness. Designing and teaching this program is heaven on earth for me and is absolutely the air that I breathe. I think it's worth repeating. Everything that happened to me, absolutely 100% happened for me. I invite you to consider everything that has ever happened to you, really happened for you.